in light of what we've talked about the past few weeks, uh, we've talked about resurrection and judgment and a bunch of things like that. I felt like it would be neg negligent, if I can say that word right, correct? If I didn't uh, finish all those topics with one last one that we really don't like to talk about or think about, but it's necessary, and that is eternal punishment. Um, obviously, hell. Uh, I can honestly tell you that in my ministry, I guess I've only preached on hell about three times. I'm talking about a single sermon exclusively devoted to it. And I can tell you where it was and when it was. It was that, that vivid and that memorable. Not that the sermon was that great, but just the brevity of the topic. It stands out. Um, so tonight we want to talk about that. Uh, before we get there, <clears throat> let's see here. I'm going to be looking at a lot of verses. You can turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 if you want, if you want to wait on me. We're going to look at several verses uh, where Jesus talks about hell. But before we get there, let me sort of set this up. There was a, uh, a church one time that was looking for a, uh, a pastor. And there was one guy in the church that held a lot of influence. And they had brought in uh, men to preach in the pulpit. One young man came and he preached on the text that the wicked uh, shall be turned into hell. And the rich man turned his thumbs down. And uh, he wasn't for him. And then the next week, another preacher came, and ironically, he preached on the same topic, the exact same text, and the guy gave a thumbs up. And they said, now, wait a minute. He, he used the same scripture, talked about the same stuff as that other guy did. What's the difference between that, that guy and this guy? And he goes, true. He says the uh, first guy, he preached that the wicked would go to hell all right, but he would... Uh, or this guy was oh so sorry, uh, but the other guy was glad of it. And, uh, you know, a lot of times the way we talk about hell to other people, we got to make sure that they realize that this is not a laughing matter. It's not a funny subject. It's not just a, a punchline that you say when you're angry about, uh, about something and you tell someone where to go. It's much more serious than that. And so if people realized how serious a place called hell is and, and uh, is that we would uh, we would approach this topic with the uh, the seriousness and the anguish and that we need to talk about it um, another illustration uh, years ago during World War II the soldiers crowded around their chaplain and they asked him a simple question they said do you believe in hell and he said I do not and they said, well then, would you please resign? Because if there is no hell, we don't need you. And if there is a hell, we don't want to be led astray. How true that is. Um, matter of fact, you need to talk to teachers and leaders today to find out what they believe about it. Um, today, the denial of the doctrine of hell or eternal punishment takes two main forms. Just kind of FYI so you know that. One of them is universalism. Uh, universalism, uh, that's the idea that hell and eternal punishment are inconsistent with the concept of a loving, powerful God. You know, you got people that aren't even in church that say that. Well, I don't believe I would go to hell. I mean, God's loving, right? He loves you. He loves me. So therefore, they conclude that in the end, all men will be saved. Hey, trust me, it sounds good, but it doesn't square with Scripture, okay? Okay. Uh, the other form today is annihilationism. Annihilationism is taught in two different forms. According to one form, man was created immortal, but those who continue in sin are deprived of immortality, and they're simply annihilated. In other words, when they die, they no longer cease to exist. Game over, that's it, kaput. Um, according to the other form, man was created mortal, Believers receive immortality as a gift of grace and therefore continue to exist in a state of blessedness after death. And unbelievers, however, do not receive this gift and hence remain mortal. Therefore, at death, they're annihilated. Both forms of annihilationism teach that annihilation of the wicked, 
uh, and they deny the doctrine of hell or eternal punishment. So you got to watch it because there are some that teach annihilism. They'll agree with you on heaven. Who wouldn't want to, you know, who, who would want to disagree with that, right? They'll, they'll agree with you on heaven, but then they'll deny hell. Uh, folks, that's not what Scripture teaches. But I do want you to be aware of the fact that there are people out there like that. And you need, to, you need to understand when you're talking about certain topics that are found in the Bible, when you're talking to someone, you kind of need to find out where they are before you just dive into the subject so you can maybe better approach the topic with them. Um, here's a quote. I have, no, I, got, I have no idea who this guy is, but I, I love the quote. It stood out to me as I was looking for quotes. Uh, one guy said, The fact that the loving and wise Savior has more to say about hell than any other individual in the Bible is certainly thought-provoking. Indeed it is. In other words, do you know who taught more about hell than anybody else in the Bible? Jesus. Jesus, that's true. So look, if you will, in the Gospel of Matthew, and we'll read verse 22. In Matthew 5, 22, Jesus is speaking. This is, uh, to put it in context, this is his Sermon on the Mount. And here's what he says in verse 22. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. And whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hell fire. So there it is, hell fire. But notice, notice the infractions that get you there. You know, we, we think of these folks that uh, have done heinous crimes that are on death row, that have life in prison, and we go, man, you know, th those, those are some really bad, mean people. We know where they're going someday. And we think it's just a few people, and the rest of society is okay because, you know, they're not locked up. But look at what Jesus says. If you're angry, you're subject to judgment. If you're angry with someone... If you insult someone, you're subject to the court. And if you say you fool, you're subject to hellfire. That's some strong, strong words. Go down a few verses there in Matthew 5. Go down to verse 29. And he mentions hell again. Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. And I think Jesus is serious when he makes those statements. He might be using hyperbole language to sort of get our attention, but I think he's serious. He means business with these, with these words that we need to make sure that we don't... Uh, allow any part of our life to cause us to sin, that we've got to deal with it. Um, and so it's better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. That, that's radical. But this is a very vital teaching that we've got to understand. When you take a closer look at the word rendered hell there in Matthew 5, it's the Greek word genna, and it's commonly spelled in English gehenna. So in the Greek, I guess it would be G-E-N-N-A. In the English, we would say G-E-H-E-N-N-A, Gehenna. Um, the New Testament word which denotes the final place of punishment is Gehenna. And this word is a Greek form of the Aramaic expression Gehenna. And that means Valley of Hinnom. And this was a valley that was south of Jerusalem where parents would sometimes offer their children as sacrifices to the uh, idol, idols of their day, like the Ammonites worshipped the idol Molech. Uh, this happened in the days of King Ahaz and King Manasseh in the Old Testament. It was also in this valley that the refuge or garbage of Jerusalem was burned. And so hence this valley became a, a type a visual, if you will, a type of sin and woe. And so the word Gehenna came to be used as a designation for the fire of hell and the place of final punishment. Um, in other words, God is using an example and a picture to say, 
You see how awful that is? You know, you go outside Jerusalem and you look at that valley over there and the things that have been done there and all the putrid smells and all the garbage and everything and everything that's burning is over there. You think that's bad? You hadn't seen nothing. He had, to, he had many times God, if he's going to teach us something new, he's got to point to something that we are familiar with and say, you see that? Well, it's much worse. Think about how we learned when we were kids. When we had to learn an abstract concept, you start with something concrete first, something simple, and you point to that and you say, well, it's kind of like that, but it's even more than that. And that's kind of what I think God is doing for us. He's giving us a picture. He's pointing to an example. And he says, if you think that's awful, you don't even know nothing. This is, this is eternal. This is forever. Turn, if you will, to Matthew 10. We'll stay in Matthew a little bit. In Matthew chapter 10, <clears throat> Jesus makes the statement. And it sort of goes with what he just said in chapter 5. In Matthew 10, 28... Jesus said, Don't fear those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Okay? Soul and body in hell. Uh, now, think about that. When we, when, we, when we look at what the Scripture teaches about the... Um, resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment everybody who's ever lived will one day be raised why will they be raised to appear before their maker their creator their judge okay and then those that do not know christ while they're in their body will be sentenced to a devil's hell and that's why jesus is saying here don't fear those who can just kill your body but fear those who are able to kill not just the body but the soul and destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Now, Jesus would know more about that than anybody, and that's what he's saying. In Matthew 18, in Matthew 18, and I just wanted to use the Gospel of Matthew as an example to see how Jesus is using and how he's talking about the concept of hell within one Gospel, okay? And so in Matthew 18, verse 8, again, he brings up the issue of hell and look at what he says in matthew 18 verse 8 if your hand or your foot causes you to fall away cut it off and throw it away it is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire and if your eye causes you to fall away gouge it out and throw it away it's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hellfire. Again, he might be using hyperbole, hyperbole language, but I believe he's serious. Let's not minimize it. Let's not dismiss it. Uh, that's what Jesus is saying. Uh, hell is serious. Then let's jump to the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, I want to read a um, similar place where Jesus talked, but Mark records some extra adjectives and superlatives to give us a, a more fuller picture of what this hellfire looks like. In Mark 9, in Mark 9, verse 43, Jesus says, If your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, the unquenchable fire. Okay, not only did he say hell, but he paints a quick description of it. The fire is unquenchable. It doesn't stop. And then, five verses later, in Mark 9, 48, he says, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So now, not only is the fire not quenched, but the worm does not die. Now, let's, uh, let me throw in an Old Testament verse just to keep you on your toes there. Uh, in Isaiah 66, if you're wondering where these references that Jesus mentioned to about the fire not being quenched and the worm doesn't die, if you wonder, where, where did that come from? Did Jesus just make that up? I mean, where did that come from? Well, let me give you a verse from the Old Testament. It's found in the last chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah 66, verse 24. And let's read it, and you'll know where Jesus got his language, his imagery, his 
references from. Isaiah 66, verse 24. As they leave, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. For their worm will never die, their fire will never go out, and they will be a horror to all mankind. There you go. Isaiah is talking about the end of time when mankind will be judged. And Jesus seizes those phrases, the worm will not die, the fire will never go out. So when Jesus taught about hell, he didn't make that up. He was right in line with the Old Testament revelation. Okay? Look, if you will, in Matthew chapter 13. We'll go back to Matthew now. In Matthew chapter 13, <clears throat> here's what Jesus said in verse 41. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather from His kingdom all who call sin and those guilty of lawlessness. They will... They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The blazing furnace, you know, links this to hellfire. So we've got the worm will not die, the fire will not be quenched, and now we've got weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? Then jump to Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, as Jesus is teaching... He says in verse 30, Throw this good-for-nothing servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There it is again. And then in verse 46, And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now that's uh, Matthew 25, 46. That's at the end of the parable of the sheep and the goats where God separates everyone and then they're judged. And what I want you to see in this statement in Matthew 25, verse 46, some go to punishment, some go to life, but notice the one common element. It's eternal. Those that go away into punishment, it will be eternal punishment. That means forever. And the righteous that go into life, it will be eternal life. That means forever. Do you see why, do you see why this is such a, a serious topic? Because the stakes are high. I mean, we're talking about man's final destination. And wherever it is, it's going to be forever. So, with that said, that's, that's a quick, as simple as I know how to make it, that's a quick glimpse of what Jesus taught about hell. It's enough for you and I to go, wow, you know, I don't want to go there. Now, there is one passage the rich man and Lazarus. I'm going to end with that tonight, okay? So I'm saving the best part for last. But I wanted you to think about those images, about the worm doesn't die, the, the fire isn't quenched, the weeping uh, and the gnashing of teeth. Uh, this is not a place that anybody would want to go, much less stay forever. So what does the rest of the New Testament teach about hell and the concept of eternal punishment, as in it never ends. Well, let me give you a few. Uh, first of all, turn to or write down this reference, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Paul the Apostle is writing his second letter to the church at Thessalonica. And this church has been persecuted. And he's telling them to hang in there. And now he's going to commend them for, you know, being faithful to God in the midst of opposition and persecution. And here's what he says about it. It is clear evidence of God's righteous judgment that you will be counted worthy of God's kingdom for which you are also suffering. In other words, the fact that you have stood against persecution and you remain faithful to God, that's evidence that you'll be counted worthy of God's kingdom, the kingdom that you're suffering for. Since it is just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us. In other words, God is going to repay those that are persecuting Christians someday. And he says this will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels when he takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. I can't think of a better verse in the Bible that explains why 
why it's necessary. They don't know God, and the reason why they don't know God is they don't obey the gospel of Jesus. And the fact that they don't obey the gospel of Jesus proves that they don't know God. You see how that works. It goes hand in hand. Uh, they will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from His glorious strength. On that day when He comes to be glorified by His saints and to be marveled at by all those who have believed because our testimony among you was believed. And so they will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence. Now that's another thought, isn't it? Not only have we talked about how this is going to be eternal destruction or punishment, but it's going to be away from the Lord's presence. That's really the worst part about hell, is uh, being away from God's presence. Uh, look, if you will, in Romans chapter 2. In Romans chapter 2, again, this is Paul the Apostle writing. He's writing to those at Rome, and he says something about God's judgment and Here's what he says in Romans 2, verse 5. Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. He will repay each one according to his works. Eternal life to those who persist, eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality but wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. There will be affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. So those that refuse to repent and turn to God before it's too late, they are storing up wrath for themselves on the day of wrath when God judges the wicked. Again, strong words. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Again, uh, we're just looking at passages in the Bible that talk about this. In Hebrews chapter 10, the, uh, the writer is telling the Hebrew people in verse 28, Anyone who disregarded the law of Moses died without mercy based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And that's true. You can read that in the Old Testament. Everything had to be... Uh, an accusation or any, any, any kind of thing that, had, that was wrong, it had to be verified by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If you go back and read the Gospels, when they were making false accusations against Jesus, they tried and tried and tried until they finally found two people that said, well, I heard him say, you know, whatever, you know. And so uh, everything had to be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse, the Bible says, punishment do you think one will deserve who is trampled on the Son of God, who is regarded as profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? So in other words, if you look at the law of Moses, uh, if you disregarded that, you died without mercy. Okay? If that was the situation for that, how much more then do you think the punishment will be for someone who disregards the, the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior who died for, for all to be saved? For we know that the one who has said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And then he says this, It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Uh, how true that is. Jump to Jude. Jude is uh, right before Revelation. It's the size of a postcard. It's probably on one page in your Bible. It's very short. Uh, right before the book of Revelation is Jude. And in verses 5, 6, and 7, here's what Jude says. And he was, the, I believe, the, the Lord's uh, brother. He says, I want to remind you, although you came to know all these things once and for all, that Jesus saved the people out of Egypt, and later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their own position, but abandoned their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains in deep darkness for the judgment on the great day. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns committed sexual immorality and perversions and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. 
Now, what is Jude saying? Jude is saying, look, I want to remind you that this salvation we got is great from God. It's a great salvation. And Jesus, he saves us from the wrath to come. And yet, those that are punished, it's real. And he mentions the angels that are in deep darkness being kept for the great day of judgment. And then he points to Sodom and Gomorrah and how they were destroyed because of their idolatry and immorality. And it's a picture of the punishment of eternal fire. And if you remember the story, it literally was destroyed by fire from, from heaven. So <clears throat> you go on down to Jude, verse 12 and 13. And he says this, these people, at this point Jude is warning the church of false teachers. Okay, so when he says these people, uh, to put that in context, he's referring to false teachers. So these false pe teachers are dangerous reefs at your love feast as they eat with you without reverence. They are shepherds who only look after themselves. They are waterless clouds carried along by winds. Trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead and uprooted. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom the black, blackness of darkness is reserved forever. And so look at that imagery there. Again, people that are, that are uh, leading others astray are going to be held accountable for that. And they're going to experience the blackness of darkness. And it's going to be forever. Let's jump to Revelation for a moment. I want you to see this. When we think about forever, eternal life, eternal damnation, I want you to get your, your mind around that for a moment. Uh, let's go to Revelation to try to grasp that. In Revelation 14... Here it says, A third angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or anyone who receives the mark of its name. Again, I believe it's talking about the final destination of the wicked. And now we see that they're going to be tormented with fire and sulfur and it's going to be there in verse 11, the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. Now, just stick with me for a minute because I want to jump to a place in Revelation chapter 4 and tie this together. In Revelation 4, when we are worshiping God because He is our Creator, um, there's a scene in heaven where they're gathered around the throne. And in Revelation 4 verse 9, Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, hold, hold on to that for a minute, okay? The 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. That, that's twice, did you catch that? They cast their crowns before the throne and they say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you've created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Now in verse 9, it talks about God as the one who lives forever and ever. And verse 10, we're reminded again, we're worshiping the one who lives forever and ever. And so what I want to say about this is this. You might say, why is God, why is he making hell a place that it's eternal torment and it never ends? Because he gives us a lifetime. He gives us a lifetime to either choose or reject him. And once we've made our choice and we're determined that we've made our choice and we're not changing our mind and for those that choose to reject Christ, they, they don't want to have any part with Him. They don't believe Him. They reject His offer of eternal life. They refuse to, to, to come to the foot of a bloodstained cross and, 
and acknowledge Him as Lord and repent of their sins and place their trust in Him, they refuse to do that, they absolutely refuse, then one of these days they will experience the rest of their existence in a place called hell forever and ever. Why? Because we have a God who lives forever and ever. And as long as He lives, that's how long it will last, forever and ever. That's serious, but we really got to get our hands around that. By comparing these two passages, we discover the torment of the lost is as endless as God Himself, who lives forever and ever. In Revelation, while we're still there, in verse 21, at the end of the book, Revelation 21, 8, But the cowards, the faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. We usually just call it the lake of fire. That's the ultimate end right there. In Hebrews, we're reminded of what I just read a few verses back. In Hebrews 2, chapter 2, verse 2. For if the message spoken through angels was legally binding, and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord and it was confirmed to us by those who heard Him. In other words, how are you and I going to escape if we neglect such a great salvation? <clears throat> With that said, let's go back to, I saved the best for last, Herman. Let's go to Luke 16. This is uh, my last scripture passage. It's the longest, but it's the last. I want us to look at the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Now that we've looked at all these little details about, you know, the, the worm and the fire and the weeping and the gnashing of teeth and the smoke and the torment and how it's never ending, it's eternal. Now that we've got all these little descriptives of uh, what hell is like, Let's make it real now. Let's look at the narrative that Jesus taught. And even though this is considered a parable, I believe it's absolutely true, or Jesus wouldn't have taught it. In Luke 16, verse 19, Jesus says, There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was lying at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table, but instead the dogs would come and lick his sores. One day the poor man died, and he was carried away by the angel to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, now we talked about this last week, Hades is the dwelling of the dead, correct? And the New Testament idea of Hades, not only as the dwelling of the dead, but particularly of those who do not know Christ, and they're experiencing some level of torment. Because those of us who know Christ to be absent from the body, right, present with the Lord, just reminding you of that distinction we talked about last time. So being in torment in Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. Now, again, remember what Jesus said? Don't be afraid of the person who can kill your body. Be afraid of the person who can kill you and you can, you can destroy your soul and body in hell. Here's this guy. And he's worried about his tongue. Sounds to me like, you know. So he's in agony in this flame, he says. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things, just as Lazarus received bad things, but now he's comforted here while you are in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you, so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot. 
and neither can those from there cross over to us. Father, he said, then I beg you to send him to my father's house, because I have five brothers to warn them so they won't also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But he told them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Oh, how true that is. Why did Abraham point to Moses and the prophets? Well, to put this in layman's terms, as simple as I know how, when you mention Moses, you think of the law. And when you think of the prophets, you think of they were looking for the Messiah. So to put that in bottom line terms, Moses, the law of Moses, shows us, you and I, that we're sinners. And the prophets are going to tell us we need a Savior. And they're ultimately going to say, He's coming. And when Jesus shows up, He's it. He's the one. And so we need to understand that we're sinners in need of a Savior or we'll never get it. Matter of fact, he says if they don't listen to that, if they don't listen to the law and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Wow. That's strong. In this story, we realize there's a few things here that, that come to my imagination, but it's a place of torment. I wonder, and I can't be dogmatic about this, I'm just saying I wonder if when all this goes down someday, the great judgment happens and those that are with Christ are in heaven and those that didn't know God are with the devil in hell, will they be able to see what people are doing in heaven? And that makes it that much more miserable because they can see it, but they can't partake of it. It's a fair question. It suggests that because here is this rich man seeing Lazarus and how good he has it, and he's begging, hey, can you just cool my tongue? But there's a chasm between the two, and the Lord says, nobody can cross over to you, and no one from you can cross over to us. There's that idea of separation, the idea of torment, and even the idea of, can you please warn my family and friends? It might be too late for me, but please tell my family. I don't want them to be here. And then the sad reality is, if they don't listen to the law and the prophets, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then nothing else will persuade them. Sad, but so true. It's my prayer tonight that you and I would just get a glimpse of the reality of hell. Let it be one of those stirring reminders that it's real. And we don't want anybody, even our worst enemy, to go there. And we need to pray for those that have not repented and placed their trust in Christ while there's still time. Have you turned from your sin? And placed your trust in Christ? That's the question you have to answer if you want to avoid a place called hell. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts, that you would stir our imaginations, help us to realize, Lord, the reality of eternal separation, punishment, and torment in a place called hell for those that do not believe and do not obey you. Where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, Lord, I pray that we would make a decision to trust and follow you before it's everlasting too late. In Jesus' name I pray and all God's people said, Amen.